Well, good morning, everybody. It's very nice to see you all here today. Welcome. It's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker. Uh, David Hodgkin is the assistant, uh, sorry, the uh, director of the intensive care unit here at Providence Portland and the assistant director for ECMO, which he's going to speak to us today about. Uh, Dr. Hodgkin completed his medical school internship residency and his chief resident year at uh, University of Washington in Seattle. He also completed his pulmonary critical fellowship, critical care fellowship there, and did a master's in epidemiology, epidemiology and clinical research. Uh, he has uh, a former vice chair of the Clinician's Advisory Committee to the American Thoracic Society. Uh, he uh, used to be the medical director of the telecritical care medicine at Prov Portland. He's been awarded Portland Monthly Magazine Top Doctors many years, and he's a personal mentor to me when I was a resident here. I gravitated, gravitated to David. Um, I always uh, observed him to have one of the quickest and fiercest minds in the ICU, um, and I always appreciated his uh, practice of what I would say relentlessly evidence-based uh, patient care. He, was, uh, he allowed me to serve as a uh, uh, or work with him in a shared practice setup during my third year of residency. So I, I uh, have great appreciation for this man. And uh, today he's going to talk to us about the new ECMO program at Providence. Thank you, Jesse. Is this on now? Good. Can everybody hear me okay? I'm always worried about that. Um, so I, I am going to talk about ECMO today. Um, I have no relevant financial disclosures um, regarding this talk, but I am going to discuss some products that are not available in the United States that have not been approved or evaluated by the FDA, um, just as informational um, discussions. The first thing, why are we talking about ECMO? Why, when we're supposed to be doing grand rounds for individuals specifically for primary care physicians, we're supposed to be talking for individuals in medical education and hospice and everything else, wh wh why are we talking about this? This esoteric small little niche inside of critical care. And the main reason is that we launched an ECMO program at Prof Portland February 1st, 2018, and I kind of wanted to talk about it. Um, and it's something that people should know about. Um, the other thing is that intensive care medicine is changing. It's constantly changing. The way that intensive care medicine looked when I started is different than it is today. Patient complexity is increasing. Intensive care medicine is changing along with our patients. And we have new and novel techniques that we'd like to have people understand. I sent one of my patients post ECMO back into the community and his PCP said, what, what is this thing that you did to my patient? I don't understand. And that's part of the idea. We also expect that new novel techniques are going to continue to emerge and we're probably going to change the way that we practice ICU medicine um, moving forward. This is a typical ICU bed. This is what it looked like when uh, John Mastronardi actually started his internship. Um, so the patient laying in the bed, there's an oscilloscope, and there's oxygen. Um, and really the first intensive care unit was really designed based upon intensive nursing needs and not necessarily intensive, engaging, and very invasive technologies. This is a picture, granted it's a young teenager, um, um, inside of an ICU in France that um, really kind of shows what the ICU looks like today. So you have a patient in the bed, there are probably 15 different drips, there's a monitor, there's a uh, ventilator, um, there's a CRT machine, the patient's also on ECMO, there are chest tubes in this picture, and every single part of the patient is being supported. And that's a lot of what we're doing. If you step into a room in the intensive care unit today, there are so many machines that you get lost. It's sometimes hard to find the patient in the room because there are so many machines, plus isolation gowns and everything else that we do. ECMO's taking off. This is uh, data out of the ELSO registry from July of 2018, just showing active ECLS centers. Um, um, these are international, and you can see that back in 1990, there were about 60, or I think about 80. Um, there are now over 350 centers. The drop-off um, that you see in 2018 is because it's a rolling readmission. So patients or um, centers don't repay their fee until it's due, just like everybody else. Um, you don't just pay it every January 1st. So the number's actually higher um, in 2018, now at the end of 2018, um, than that data shows. The number of adult respiratory cases on ECMO has skyrocketed. There's a 463% increase in the utilization of ECMO since the early 2000s to now. Um, and it's something that you're going to be seeing more and more of. Cardiac cases have also skyrocketed, um, almost no cases back in 1980s, and in 2016, um, you're seeing um, over 1,400 cases um, cumulative. 
my goal today is to talk about ECLS, extracorporeal life support, and ECMO, describe the basic components of ECMO, describe the process or the progress of ECMO since its inception, review the indications for ECMO, the exclusions for ECMO, review the data supporting ECMO utilization, and describe the limitations and complications of ECMO and kind of talk about where this field is going. So what is it? Extracorporeal membrane oxygenation is actually just taking blood out of the body, spinning it around and sticking it right back in with the addition of an oxygenator. So it's basically a simple pump, circulates the blood, adds oxygen, removes carbon dioxide, and you can change the way that you make it work by hooking it up to the patient differently. The cartoons that are up there show a venovenous circulation. So um, I don't know if I have my, um, uh, I think here's my pointer here. So in this patient here, you've got a drainage cannula that's coming all the way down from the inferior vena cava. So the tip of the cannula is sitting at the caveoatrial junction, coming all the way out, goes through a pump, goes back through the body, or goes through this blender and an oxygenator, and then back in through the internal jugular and deposits right back into the right atrium. In this one over here, we have a dual lumen cable um, catheter. So just one really big catheter that goes through the IJ, um, actually pulls blood out of the inferior vena cava and the superior vena cava goes back through the pump, through the oxygenator, exposed to air, and then goes back in through the same cannula, um, being injected right here inside of the right atrium. We'll look at that a little bit more. ECMO is simple, kind of. It's a pump, an oxygenator, and some cannulas. And that's it. Um, I spent five years trying to get this program up and going. This is the fifth year, so four years ahead of time. Um, I spent so much time working on it. We put some patients on. My wife, who's a primary care provider here, came in to see what was going on. She looked at it and said, that's it? That's really what you've been spending all this time working on? And I was like, yeah, um, that, that really is it. Historically, it was a roller pump, so they would actually have these tubes um, and pump rollers that would push the blood through. It was a high-pressure system. It went really slow, um, and that's the idea behind typical cardiopulmonary bypass. We now use a centrifugal pump. We have a membrane oxygenator that allows you to add in oxygen, remove carbon dioxide, and it also allows for heat exchange. You can expose the blood to a certain temperature of a bath and actually change the temperature of the patient, and then you have the inflow and the outflow cannulas. Here's a cartoon really describing it. It shows you just a little bit more. So you draw the blood out of the patient, you put it through the pump, and you shove it back through. You control the amount of carbon dioxide removal and the amount of oxygen being added in by using a blender that allows you to blend the air component, the oxygen component. The, the gases flow across in a countercurrent exchange, and so the blood comes in with low oxygen, pulls in just like the lungs, allows oxygen to come in, carbon dioxide to come out, returns oxygenated decarboxylated blood back into the patient, and then improves the oxygenation, at least as the thought. So yeah, so the, the rate of flow depends upon the patient, how sick they are, and what else is going on. We try to achieve about 0.6, or about 60% of the patient's native cardiac output. So depending upon how sick they are and what form of sepsis. So the question was, what rate of flows do we go? Uh, we run flows anywhere from, we try not to drop our flow rates below three liters per minute, um, but the highest we've gone is about 7.5 liters per, per minute. So really high, yeah really high, but that was in a patient who had an estimated 11 liter cardiac output because of severe septic shock. So when you're seeing really significant shock systems and really severe hypoxemia, oftentimes you need really, really high flows. We can support upwards of seven liters. This is a VA cannulation. So what I was formerly showing you was the veno venous. We draw from the vein, return to the vein. This is a veno arterial system. So we're drawing out of the IVC. We're putting it through the same kind of a pump here. We're oxygenating it and then putting it back into the arterial circulation. So you're actually getting a countercurrent. This allows you to provide support individuals with cardiogenic shock, individuals have myocardial dysfunction, um, and when it's not just an oxygenation issue. You can also do something called a, a hybrid model where you can do veno, or veno, veno arterial, where you actually pull out of the vein and then partially return into the vein and partially return into the artery. And it gets really complicated and you have to move things around, but it is something that you can do. ECMO really started back in the 1970s. So this is not a new technology, even though people are talking about it more. The initial description of use of ECMO to support a patient was in 1972, published in the New England Journal of Medicine. A 24-year-old man in Santa Barbara, out for the day on his motorcycle, crashed had subadventitial sub transection of the aorta, widened mediastinum, was taken to the operating room. 
Um, the description from the surgeon says that his heart and lungs appear to be normal. They could support him. His PaO2 on the bypass was over 300. They took him off after they controlled his bleeding. Oh, I'll minimize that. Um, and um, left him on the ventilator, but on his, had worsening oxygenation. And by day five, on a FiO2 of 1.0 and a PEEP of 8, he had a PaO2 of 38 and saturations in the 60% range. His plateau pressures back in the day before they knew a lot about ARDS, they were actually trying to use plateau pressures in order to ventilate him. They were achieving plateau pressures of 60, which is an anathema to individuals that train in our ICU right now. Um, and they decided that they were going to try this thing. This, the surgeon was actually a San Francisco surgeon who happened to be moonlighting down in um, Santa Barbara and actually called his friend. And the Navy picked up his oxygenator and took it to him in Santa Barbara. It's, this is all described in this case report. This is uh, some, some of the data out of this initial report. So this is the initial chest radiograph. These, this is his chest x-ray six days post-operative. There's an endotracheal tube in place. There are bilateral opacities. And this actually really doesn't look that bad compared to a lot of patients that we take care of now. 48 hours post ECMO, his chest radiograph looks better. And 30 days after injury, it almost looks normal. You can see here that the bypass, this is where they started him on ECMO. You can see his airway pressures here. They're already running in the 30 range, which is kind of standard for management of patients. They're going up to plateau pressures of 60. And once they're able to get him on ECMO, they can actually drop his plateau pressures. Still not into lung protective ventilation, but better. His tidal volumes here are crazy. This is just historical for residents when I tell you that we used to really, really give large volumes. At baseline, they're giving him tidal volumes of 800 milliliters, and here they're giving him almost a liter tidal volume every time they're giving him a breath. You can see that his FiO2 is kind of all over the place. It's up to 100%. It's down, and here they're trying to maintain him. Um, and you can see what his PaO2 is. It's down here in the 38 range, and once he's on ECMO, things start to improve, and it gets up to a max of 390 at this point. This is what it looks like. This is the Bramson ECMO machine, or the Bramson oxygenator. This is a bunch of silicone tubing, which is wrapped inside of a swinging arm that puts pressure on the machine and pushes the blood through the tubing. There's contact injury. It's silicone, so it activates everything. Um, the machine is huge. You can actually see the nurses are back here. You can't even see them because they're hiding behind this massive machine. This is the first time it was ever used. This is the gentleman here. Notice they also trached him immediately. Um, they did the trach at the same time they cannulated him. Um, and this is a description from the same case report of how much blood they had to give to him. Notice that he required 21 units of whole blood, 19 units of pack cells, 16 of FFP, 32 of platelets. And you can see his platelet concentration and his hematocrit running through here. So there was a lot of bleeding. There was a lot of hemolysis. Um, the individual was incredibly sick. His kidneys weren't working. They had to support him with dialysis. But he left and walked out of the hospital, went to rehab. And that 34-day post-ECMO was when he came back in to get routine PFTs. So this was an individual that was supported for five days on ECMO, able to be weaned off of it and live. So this stirred a lot of interest. People were like, well, this is great. At the same time, I think we need to have just a little digression to talk about ARDS because ARDS is really kind of the driver behind why I'm talking about respiratory ECMO. There's different forms of ECMO, and really we're talking about support for respiratory distress. This is ARDS. ARDS is bilateral pulmonary infiltrates in an acute setting. The definition changed from 1995, which a lot of people know. In 2012, we adapted the Berlin definition, which is within one week of the onset of a known clinical insult or worsening respiratory symptoms, where you have bilateral opacities not fully explained by pleural effusions, lobar lung collapse or nodules, evidence of pulmonary edema not due predominantly to left ventricular failure, and then we grade the severity based upon a PDF ratio of less than 300, um, gives you the definition of ARDS. We call it either mild, moderate, or severe. The reason it's important is that mortality for ARDS remains about 40%. Individuals that have mild ARDS have a 30% mortality rate. It's hard to teach our residents that when you're seeing individuals with mild ARDS, you still have a 30% or one in three individuals with ARDS will be dead within 30 days. Mild ARDS mortality rate of 30%, moderate about 40 and severe, severe ARDS is 50%. We know that this is the case. This is a temporal trend. Um, this is a um, from Niall Ferguson's group um, in 
uh, it's not the Brompton, it's the Giles Peak Hospital in um, uh, the UK. But you can see that these are, we were looking at initially, even prior to this, mortality rates that were um, about 60% mortality rate. We're now looking at a slow trend down over time, where we're still looking at an overall mortality rate of about 40%. You can see this in more recent studies. Um, when they looked at prone ventilation, the mortality rate was 58% in individuals that with, with what we would call moderate severe, so a PDF ratio of less than 150. Um, if you look at the data out of the OSCAR study, um, that we saw 50% of patients in each group, these are again with a PDF ratio of less than 150, had a 50-50 chance of death. So 50% mortality in this situation. Lung safe study was just published in 2018 that showed the same thing. Um, and this is actually a graph out of their study that really showed that the mortality rate ends up being about 46% for all comers. And this is in um, over uh, 50, sorry, yeah, 50 different countries. Um, I forget how many different hospitals they looked at. These are all um, high volume ARDS centers that actually have lower reported mortality rates than the standard centers um, um, internationally. So it's a bad condition, it's really bad. The other reason that it's really important is that we know that if you ventilate the lungs wrong, that you can actually cause more damage to the lungs. This is a, um, you know, one of those slides that everybody has to show when you're talking about ARDS. These are rat lungs that are taken and harvested, and they right after they ventilate the rat, um, you give them, this is microscopic, so you give them peak pressures at 45 cc's. These are normal lungs. This is after five minutes of high airway pressure, and this is after 20 minutes. The lungs become necrotic, they fill up with fluid, they fill up with blood, they get destroyed. And we know that if we ventilate individuals with high pressures, that we will cause this over and over and over again. And part of the problem is that when your patients have severe hypoxemia, if you have nothing else to do, you try to increase the pressure on the ventilator to try to really improve the ventilation of the patient, improve the oxygenation. And when you do that, you damage the lungs more and more. So ARDS is bad. Back in the 1970s, we were seeing a 60% mortality rate. That means you were only seeing survival in one in three individuals. They said, we should really do something about this. In 1974, the NIH had the first, we always talk about ARMA or the study that was published in 2000 as being the first big ARDS study, but this was the NIH's first ARDS study that they were going to do. They were gonna solve ARDS, they were gonna fix their patients, and they did a randomized 150 patients to partial veno arterial ECMO for acute respiratory failure. In order to get into the study, you had to have a PaO2 of less than 50 for over two hours on 100% FiO2 and a PEEP of over five, or a PaO2 of less than 50 for 12 hours on greater than 60% and a PEEP of five. And you were excluded if you were on the ventilator for over 21 days. And it's kind of a long time on the ventilator, or if your pulmonary capillary wedge pressure was over 25. And this is what they found. They randomized the individuals and they had a 10% survival rate in both arms not at 30 days, but at 12 days. They were seeing one in 10 individuals was surviving to 12 days. And if you see out to 68, um, they're barely seeing, I think there was a 2% survival rate at 68 days, which is completely unheard of. Granted, these patients were incredibly sick, but it also showed that VA ECMO, the way that they were doing it, didn't work. And this was regarded as the death of adult ECMO. They said, we're not gonna do it. There's this guy in Michigan who doesn't believe it. Um, so he's actually a pediatric cardiac surgeon and he's had great success operating on babies and neonates and supporting these patients. And he has these great stories of saving lives. And actually there's this great story of baby Esperanza, um, which really kind of fits in that this woman who was in Mexico decided she wanted to give her daughter a new chance at life. And so she came across the border illegally and was walking, was um, made it across um, before we had a wall or anything else. and um, went into labor um, when she was near Irvine and had premature rupture of her membranes and the baby was delivered, had massive meconium aspiration. They couldn't support the baby. Um, they were trying to figure out what was going on. And this surgeon, Bob Bartlett, who had actually worked in San Francisco and knew about this stuff, borrowed an oxygenator and put the baby on it. The mom subsequently disappeared because she was there illegally and thought she was gonna be deported and left her baby there. And they supported her and the baby left alive had been adopted and there's now follow-up stories. She's actually the first um, neonate that's supported. And they've been doing support for neonates with meconium aspiration and severe pediatric respiratory distress syndrome for decades 
Michigan started doing this, and you can see their experience back in 1980s, they were doing not a lot of cases, but they were just doing a little bit here and there. And then right around here, they started using it for cardiac support. And then as time went on, they had some cases where you thought, well, maybe this would help an adult. And so they started doing some, they started to expand it, and they were really doing more. And there were a lot of people out there that were believers, people that really felt that they could do something with ECMO and it would change their life and they would um, see improvements if they could just really get the technique down. Plus, there were changes over the decades. When we first started doing ECMO, we used low flows and we did veno arterial ECMO to support individuals with respiratory failure. As you imagine, if you're taking a, a center, you're taking blood, you're putting it through high pressure and then now putting it back into the artery. You're increasing risk of clot because you're squishing the blood, damaging things, and you have a low flow system. And we know from Burkow's trial that low flow and exposure to a um, sticky surface increased the risk of clot. So patients were having strokes. You were actually taking clot and shoving it back into their, into their aorta and having it distribute into their mesentery, into their legs, or even back up into their head. There was increased bleeding. Individuals had Harlequin syndrome. If you administer oxygenated blood into the leg, but the heart is still pumping and the lungs are damaged, the heart's pumping deoxygenated blood, which is now being pumped to the head. So you're actually causing cerebral anoxia while you're perfusing the leg. Um, and that's not a good thing to do. They use silicon membranes, which increase the risk of clot. They use the roller pumps, as I mentioned. We started talking about doing venovenous, where we said, really, the problem with these patients is they just need oxygen. They need oxygen to get rid of carbon dioxide, but it's not so much that they need cardiac support the majority of the time. If we run things really high at a really fast rate, then it's unlikely that we're going to have clot. If we run it at a really high rate, there's less risk of bleeding. And we switch from using silicone to polymethylpentene um, and put heparin inside of it. And that heparin prevents the clotting and it makes it more biosimilar and biocompatible. And we also developed these long lasting membranes. Previously, they had to do oxygenator changes about every two to three days. Now the longer lasting membranes can last a lot longer. We also got smaller pumps. So remember the old Bransom machine that took up the entire room? This is the cardio help, and this is what we have upstairs. This is sitting in between the legs of a patient who's about to go onto a helicopter. So we've taken the pump, we've minimized, we've taken the oxygenator, we've minimized it, and we now have a portable machine that I can carry myself, and I'm a weakling. Um, so it, it's actually easy, and you can get flows on this machine up to seven liters per minute. This is what the pump looks like. So it sucks blood in and spins it around. There's no blood inside of the circuit here. This is just for demonstration, but it'll actually suck stuff in through the center, spins it around and then shoots it out the side. It's electric. Um, it has, it's a centrifugal pump that goes from zero to 4,000 RPMs. So it basically, by creating a vacuum, sucks things in um, and then spits it back out. You can deliver flows up to eight liters per minute with the pump itself, and it's very reliable and lasts up to 21 days. There's a report of one of these pumps actually being used on one patient for over 60 days. Um, the longest surviving individual on ECMO is over 600 days at this point. Um, uh, I, don't, I hope we never have a patient like that here. And then the oxygenator change. So instead of that big thing, this is an example of the quadrox oxygenator. We use a similar version to this. It has these hollow fiber membranes. Um, they're heparin coated. It allows the red blood cells to go by, pick up the oxygen, allow the carbon dioxide to come off. And these things also last for 15 to 21 days. So it's easy. You can support people. You don't have to change. You don't have to worry about the entire system failing. The cannulas are also a big issue. In the past, we had, you know, it was difficult. We left a lot of IVs in. We now have these large, big cannulas. Remember Poisson's law that the flow is directly proportional to pi times the change in pressure to the radius of the fourth power, eight times the viscosity, and um, divided by the length. What that really means is that the flow that you can generate is a function of the fourth power of the cannula diameter. It's really the radius, but we think about the diameter. And so in order to maximize the flow, we maximize the drainage cannula. And by maximizing that, we do 25 to 30 French cannulas. For those people that don't do French a lot, 0.3 millimeters equals one French. So 30, 30 French is one centimeter. So we're taking cannulas about the size of your thumb and inserting it all the way up into the cable atrial junction and sucking blood out of the right atrium. We do slightly smaller ones for return because you don't have as much worry about the resistance. This allows you to out lower decrease pump speed, pressure and flow, and minimizes hemolysis. Because of all of this, because of these changes, some individuals, these true believers, individuals that said ECMO is the way of the future, said we need to do this. ARDS mortality remains high and severe ARDS. You're st still seeing mortality rates in the 1980s and 1990s in the 50 to 60 percent range. We know that these machines work better. Let's see if this really works.
This was published in Lancet in 2009, and they had an inclusion was a Murray score, which we'll talk a little bit more of, greater than or equal to 3 or uncompensated hypercapnia with a pH of less than 7.2 despite optimal therapy, and they had to have reversible <laughs> respiratory failure as a cause. You could not have been on the ventilator for over seven days. Remember, the prior study was greater than uh, up to 21 days, and you couldn't have intracranial bleeding, and you had to be able to have access to a site. The way that the study worked is that you had to, um, so they had 766 patients were screened. They excluded 586, 103 because their ECMO units were full. 99 had a, P, a Murray score of less than, just didn't meet inclusion criteria. 86 had been on the ventilator for over seven days, and 298 were other. Um, they just had reasons that they felt like they either couldn't cannulate them, the family wasn't committed to care, or to, to ongoing aggressive care, committed, always committed to care. They randomized 180 individuals, 90 were consideration for, um, for retrieval for ECMO. So these were small little hospitals um, out in the community, and they would decide if they were going to go get the patient and, or leave them there and just get conventional management. And really that's the most important thing, is that they were either transferred for ECMO or left the center to receive standard of care. They had 52 patients in the um, treatment arm and 32 in the control arm assessed um, at the end of the study. The patients were sick. Their Murray score was 3.5 um, to 3.4. That's a component of, so it's a summed average score of the P to F ratio, how much PEEP they're requiring, the lung compliance, and how many um, quadrants on their chest X-ray are actually involved. So you can see the majority of these individuals actually had almost all four quadrants, or at least three. Their lung compliance was very low, and most of them had a very low pH, um, if, they, if that was the reason for going on it, um, with a pH of 7.1. And this is what the survival curve looked like. So it showed that 50% of the patients that had control therapy died, and only about 60%, or sorry, and 60% of individuals that got ECMO survived, which should have been regarded as a success, right? So ECMO shows that it works. The problem with the study is that, um, and when you look at the number, those individuals that met the criteria for death or severe disability at six months, you had survival of 63% versus 47% with a p-value of 0.03. And when you look at those individuals that um, the p-value is uh, 0.07 for six months, though, which really raises the question of whether or not you're just expending a lot of resources right up front to not get you past three months. The other problem is that the patients who were left at the standard therapy, standard centers, didn't get standard of care. Over 30% of patients didn't receive lung protective ventilation, and lung protective ventilation is the one thing that we know consistently improves outcomes in ARDS. So again, this raised the question of if the mortality difference isn't, mortality rate isn't different at six months, and if the small centers are actually just not providing adequate care, why are we taking patients and putting them on ECMO in order to not save lives after six months? There was not a lot of prone positioning at the time, so only 42% of patients, they gave a lot of steroids. And the other interesting thing that's a little bit weird is they did this thing called MARS. The study was actually, the center was there was actually doing a liver dialysis at the same time, so 17% <coughs> of patients got liver dialysis in the study. If anything, that's a bend towards support ECMO because the MARS study actually showed that it increased the risk of death. So those patients who got it were more likely to die. Um, but it's, it's just also an interesting, you're not supposed to put patients in two different studies at the same time. All in all, we know that when you look at those patients that were in the um, individuals that received ECMO were in the ICU for a long time, um, and if you survived, you were there for a really long time, about 35 days on average, which also raises really increased the risk of cost. The Caesar takeaway was that because there were, sorry, the other thing that I forgot to mention is if you go back into this part here, is that not everybody actually got ECMO. So of those 90 that were transferred, only 68 received ECMO, and those are all included in the survival period, right? So um, 22 patients actually that were transferred for ECMO didn't get that. Because of that, the recommendations of the ECMO group were um, that those individuals that had a Murray score of over three or had a pH of less than 7.2 on optimum conventional mechanical ventilation should be transferred to a center with an ECMO-based management protocol to significantly improve survival without severe disability. But that left a lot of controversy. There was low adoption of lung protective ventilation in the control arm. It was a high cost in the NHS. It was about $120,000 per patient and about $40,000 quality adjusted life year for those individuals who survived. It's still less than the data or the threshold we've established with dialysis. But 
people took this away is just transfer the patients to a high volume center. And some centers in the United States actually bought an ECMO machine, but never used it. They said that all we really want to do is just be an ECMO center and we'll be an ECMO center in name only. So there were hospitals that bought machines and they sat in the corner and they never used them just so that they could say that they could do ECMO because they didn't buy into the study. And this was really felt by a lot of people that this was going to be the death of ECMO, really. Right, 1972 was the death of the global ECMO. Caesar showed that it really didn't work and we really didn't need to do anything. And the takeaway in the mainstream community was it doesn't really show that we need to do this on a regular basis. Published in early 2009 and later 2009, everybody remembers that we had swine flu. H1N1 was described in Mexico. Everybody was worried about this. There were pandemics declared. China was shutting down schools. Everybody was worried. The um, Perez Padilla paper described these individuals, 18 individuals that had severe um, respiratory failure, sudden onset of symptoms with um, 10 out of 18 individuals requiring mechanical ventilation and a 39% mortality rate for individuals presenting with H1N1. And everybody was freaked out. And this swept through the Southern Hemisphere, and we saw it in New Zealand, and we saw it in um, Australia first. And this is a chest radiograph from a young 25-year-old person who presented within 24 hours of the onset of their flu symptoms. And they went from room air to severe hypoxemia to a chest x-ray where you cannot see air at all. And on the CT scan, you see some air bronchograms, but you see maybe a couple of alveoli. And this is a chest radiograph of a patient that is not supportable with mechanical ventilation. There is no way that you can provide oxygen and remove carbon dioxide in a patient who has a chest x-ray like this. And we saw H1N1 everywhere. And they published their data where they looked at, it was a innate randomized trial because Australia and New Zealand were not set up to be able to support everybody. And there was a limitation on who they could take. And when their units were full, you couldn't take anybody else, and when they were open, they would accept patients in transfers. So this is looking at individuals who were accepted for ECMO and placed on ECMO with H1N1 and individuals who didn't make it on because there was either some contraindication or the unit was full or something else happened or there were clouds overhead and they couldn't get a helicopter to move them from the North Island to the South Island. And what you can see is that the survival rate for those chest radiographs, these were individuals that had PDF ratios in the 30 to 40 range, was 80%. And those individuals that got standard care was 50%, which is what standard mortality for ARDS is. 80% survival, which didn't make sense when we were seeing individuals dying left and right. And they said that this is really interesting. And when you look at this and they do a propensity score and they look at all the individuals that except when you did this propensity matching and kind of looked at everything else, everything in the analysis suggested that you saw a 50% relative risk reduction in the risk of death if you had H1N1 and you got treated with ECMO if you met their inclusion criteria. And all of a sudden people were talking about ECMO again, like maybe this really does help. The United States Critical Illness Clinical Trials Group actually came out with a statement in 2016 based upon this data saying that refractory hypoxemia is more common um, than in usual ARDS, um, and it's often shock secondary to RV dilation and anecdotal experiences that shock improves dramatically with just treatment, and they recommended, with not a strong recommendation, but they recommended that ECMO be used. If you are in this situation, you have access to ECMO, you should provide ECMO to these patients which is really interesting because it's not completely based upon data, but it's based upon the experience of these individuals. And I got to tell you that my former mentor was the lead author on this statement, and he was the person who taught me that ECMO doesn't work. That's what he taught me. ECMO doesn't work. And we were at one of those centers at the time that had an ECMO machine in the box just so that we could have patients sent to us because we didn't really want to use it because we didn't think that it was going to work. But that led to Eolia. Um, this was published earlier this year. Some of you may have seen it. This was designed to be a pragmatic trial designed to address the prior failures. So they said our inclusion criteria is the same. You had to P have a PDF ratio of less than 50 for over three hours. You had to have a PAO2 um, or less than 80 for six hours or a pH of less than 725 with your carbon dioxide level of over 60 for over six hours. If you have them on adequate ventilation and instead of just being a plateau pressure of 30, which is what Arma said, well, you allow you to go to a plateau pressure of 32 but you have to maximize the ventilator at a respiratory rate of 35. So it really had to be despite maximum ventilator optimization. They were encouraged to use neuromuscular blockade. They were encouraged to use prone ventilation. And transfers were allowed if the patient was randomized or they were left at the referring facility.
So not everybody was brought in. They said, we're only going to bring in those patients if we're going to put you on ECMO. If we're not going to put you on ECMO, you're going to stay there. So it was truly a randomized trial of ECMO, and they would actually go out, cannulate these patients in the field, and then bring them back. The primary endpoint, if you look at this out of the table, so um, the one of the, uh, let me, before, the study also because it, it's interesting. If you do a study, you're supposed to have clinical equipoise. You're supposed to not be sure whether or not this happens, whether or not the treatment is really worthwhile. But the physicians who were doing the study didn't believe that ECMO didn't work. So they felt that they had to allow a rescue for individuals that were failing conventional therapy. So you were still allowed to cross over. And you were allowed to cross over with some pretty sp specific indications. And one of those indications was death. Right? So if you died on conventional mechanical ventilation, they would crash you and put you on ECMO and move you into the other arm. So if you had CPR, they would put you on ECMO, and then you would, you would continue in the control arm, and they would support you that way. And um, there were actually a lot of patients that ended up on ECMO because they died. Um, the primary endpoint of mortality at 60 days in the intention to treat arm, you can look, see the survival, the mortality rate was 35% in the ECMO group and 46% in the um, in the control arm. 46% is pretty good. That's actually, you know, about what we're seeing in the lung safe study and all of the other states we look at, but the p-value is 0.09. If you look at their key secondary endpoint, which is treatment failure, okay, so that's either treatment failure is either that you survived or died. If you, It's basically you're dead if you're on ECMO, okay, but if you're on conventional mechanical ventilation, the treatment failure is that you got so sick that we couldn't support you and we were obligated to put you on ECMO. There were six patients, sorry, there were 16 patients that were crashed onto ECMO and eight of them actually were dead at the time that they were placed onto ECMO. If you count those individuals as deaths because they were actually truly dead and if you completely excluded them from ECMO because six out of those eight actually survived, that there's actually a mortality benefit if you redo the numbers. But the way that they did the initial study, the a priori pre-specified analysis is it was a question of whether or not you were alive or dead. And so those individuals kind of sit off to the side. The study was stopped early secondary to futility. Futility because they were unable to show a statistically significant benefit if they were to continue the study to a pre-specified enrollment point. Um, and this is what the, this is what the Kaplan-Meier curve looks like. So the p-value is 0.07. But there's a pretty big separation here, and that separation actually looks very similar to the other studies that we've looked at. It is consistent with the CSER study. It's consistent with prone ventilation study. It's convinced, consistent with other studies that we've looked at. And so really this gets into a question that, or sorry, the key secondary endpoints, so ECMO group um, and then the control group, if you look at um, treatment failure at 35% in the ECMO group, which is the same as the mortality rate, 57% failure rate in the treatment arm. And then the separation is much bigger with a p-value of less than 0.001. Neil Ferguson, who's the lead author on a couple of other studies and was involved in this, says that when you interpret a clinical study, you really only have two options. I already knew that, or I don't believe that. Okay. And when you look at this study, you have to decide, do you believe the Aeolia study or do you not? Right. So. I, you know, the, the, my bias is that I launched the ECMO program in February of 2018, and these results were published in May of 2018. I just spent four years of my life working on this, and I'm like, crap, what does this study really show me? And I spent a lot of time looking at this and reading the accompanying editorials with it. When you look at a paper, you have to understand the errors that are implicit in a study. There are type 1 errors. You prove something that actually was just a random occurrence, okay, false positives, or a type 2 error. You failed to prove something because you did not have the power to prove this. And remember, when you design a study, we try to protect against type 1 errors, right? So we set our alpha at 0.05, saying that we want, we'll accept a 5% false positive rate. But we usually accept a type 2 error or a power of 80% in order to detect, to detect a difference. We are more willing to spend more money to replicate studies over and over again, accepting a 20% chance or a 1 in 5 chance that we actually won't set up the study to do this right. And this is just a good slide to kind of describe that, right? So with the male patient, a type 1 study, um, you're pregnant, right? It's not really true, but the type 2 error is that female patient with the protuberant abdomen with the baby inside that you can actually palpate, and they say, you know, the really study shows that you're not pregnant at all. 
Or as Brian Cuthbertson says, when you actually look at when we design studies, there's real world implications. When you try and do something, you know, he's a statistician that works on these studies and he says, this is an example of a conversation he has, can you do a power calc? Well, I need an alpha. Well, 0.05, that's what we always do. I need a beta, 80%, good. Confidence stage on interval, 50%. Need a delta, the chance that we're gonna see a difference in outcomes is 3%. You're gonna need 5,831 patients. Well, crap, right, you know? Now that I think of it, we're gonna look for a difference of about 20% in terms of the risk that we're gonna be looking at. In that case, you need 124. In reality, when we try and set up studies, we actually pick, use data, and when we look for things, we assume that this is what's going to happen. The Eolia study was based upon old data before we had prone ventilation, before we had neuromuscular blockade, and we saw a decrease in mortality rate prior to when they were initially doing the studies, 50 to 60% mortality rate, and we dropped in the control arm or mortality rate to about 46%. If you do the power calculations based upon the observed outcomes, you would need to have 622 patients randomized and separated out in order to see the observed difference and actually be able to prove that you were actually able to do this, okay? Took six years to try and enroll all the patients. It took a lot of money, a lot of resources. It's really unlikely anybody's gonna do that. So some really smart statisticians said, well, let's do Bayesian analysis. Let's start with what our pretest probability is. Let's look at where we're at. Let's look at this data. Let's reanalyze it and look at it for a posterior probability and try and go through this. I'm not gonna spend a lot of, inf a lot of time on this, but basically, this is a really interesting study if you're really in statistics. Um, basically, this shows that if you're really enthusiastic for ECMO, this basically doesn't change your interpretation at all. If you're moderately enthusiastic, it doesn't change your interpretation at all. It actually supports that you should be doing ECMO. The interesting thing is that even if you're strongly skeptical about ECMO, the results of this study actually suggest that there's a 78% likelihood that ECMO actually saves lives. When you run that against the population, if we start doing ECMO using these inclusion criteria, if you anticipate the way that you should, the way that you would be doing it out of the Eolia study, the expectation is you would actually save a thousand lives annually in the United States alone with a number needed to treat of about 15, which really doesn't seem like it's that big of a deal if it really would potentially help. The accompanying editorial by Roger Lewis and Derek Angus actually says clinicians and researchers should no longer ask, does ECMO work? Because that question appears to have been answered. Instead, the key question that should be asked is, by how much does ECMO work, in whom, and at what cost? The other thing to do is to look at real world experience. So after the CSER study, the NHS decided that they were going to invest and they developed these severe respiratory failure centers. So they, they it used to be just ECMO at one center. They now have eight different ECMO centers in the United Kingdom. And if you have patients that meet criteria, they get a phone call and they decide what they're gonna do. Between 2012 and October of 2015, they looked at 578 patients um, that were referred for evaluation. 14 were excluded because five died before they could transfer them. 14 were transferred to ECMO centers outside of the United Kingdom because of lack of beds available at these ECMO centers. 272 patients were left at the referring center and they just got treatment, treatment advice because of either non-reversible respiratory failure, contraindications, the patients weren't sick enough or other reasons. 73 patients were transferred to their facilities on mechanical ventilation, but they went out and retrieved and put on ECMO 219 patients or 38% of these in, of all referrals. They have a survival rate for those patients that were placed on ECMO of 72.8% versus 16% in those patients that were declined. Granted, there's a huge amount of indication bias in this. This is not a randomized study. But the interesting thing is these high value centers, these high experience centers, they're seeing survival rates in these individuals that are greater than is published in any other field at 72%. And the survival for those rescued, once they were rescued, was actually 72.1% for those receiving ECMO and 76% for those individuals that were just continued on mechanical ventilation, which really still argues that you should be transferring patients to high volume centers with real world experience. Where do we go from this? Well, this is kind of what I take away from this, is that what, if you have an individual with ARDS, you initiate standard lung protective ventilation, you try diuresis if possible, you resuscitate to improve their cardiac output, their oxygen delivery. If their PDF ratio is less than 150, you do prone positioning, you try neuromuscular blockade, you try high PEEP, you try, could consider recruitment maneuvers, you could try inhaled pulmonary vasodilators. If, despite this, they have a PDF ratio of less than 80 for over six hours or an FIO PDF ratio of less than 50 for over three or these other things, then you consider ECMO. And you consider whether or not you should move on to early ECMO or salvage ECMO. The data out of the Eolia study suggests that if you're going to determine this as either 
early or salvaged, patients that got early would probably do better than those that got salvaged. The other difference that we have here is we aren't really set up to do salvage ECMO. In France, where they did this study, they have mobile teams of individuals. It's actually a cardiac surgery fellow who's available, and they put him in a car with a police officer and a police escort, and he runs out with a really big cannula. And with them doing CPR on patients, he shoves large cannulas into these patients, and then they put them in an ambulance and drive them back to where they're going to go. Uh, it's actually pretty interesting. The There are downsides to ECMO, though, right? So I've talked about the pluses. I've talked about what the data shows. But we know that you can have oxygenator failure. So you can have a patient that's just on it, and all of a sudden the oxygenator quits working. That occurs about 17% of the time. You can get clots in the oxygenator. Um, you have clots in the circuit. Um, you can have bleeding from the cannula. Um, you can have surgical site bleeding about 20% of the time, cannulation site bleeding about 17% of the time pulmonary hemorrhage, GI hemorrhage about 8% of the, or sorry, 5% of the time, and intracranial hemorrhage is one of the big things that we worry about that occurs 4% of the time. And every patient that we have on ECMO, especially when, you know, you put someone on, they are usually, they're neuromuscular blockade, they're deeply sedated, you can't do a neurological exam on them, you cannulate them, you put them on a high-dose anticoagulation, and then you sit there and wait and just hope that they didn't bleed into their head while you're supporting them. There are other things you can do just besides ARDS. You can put patients with severe asthma on there. It's great for um, getting rid of carbon dioxide. You can treat COPD exacerbations. You can treat plastic bronchitis, individuals you just can't ventilate at all. There's a case report of an individual who had a cement aspiration. He fell into a cement mixer and aspirated cement into his trachea and into his lungs. They put him on ECMO. They were actually able to do a rigid and actually somehow pull out these casts of cement from inside by chiseling out the different pieces. Um, massive PE supported with hypoxemia, bronchopleural fistula. We can put patients on ECMO, give them minimal ventilation, and allow the BPF to uh, heal. Patients with tracheal occlusion and stenosis, and you can also do it as a bridge to lung transplantation. You can also just try and remove carbon dioxide. I've been talking about oxygen, but remember the lungs do something else. We also get rid of carbon dioxide. And decarboxylation, not ventilation, because it's just using the machine. It's a machine to get rid of carbon dioxide. The decarboxylation is much more efficient with these ECMO machines than it is the oxygenation part. And with really low flows, you can get rid of a lot of carbon dioxide, and it's not as flow dependent. So really run low flows and everything else. And because of that, there's this passive CO2 removal device. This is a Nova lung. Um, so this is for your patient with severe COPD with an intact cardiac output that is failing BiPAP and you're worried that you're going to have to put them on the ventilator. Instead, what you do is you actually cannulate their artery in their vein, or, or sorry, you cannulate their, both of their arteries um, and in the, both of their femoral arteries, and it pumps blood through this machine and actually gets rid of carbon dioxide. It's a passive ECMO device dependent upon the patient's intact cardiac output, and it actually just gets rid of carbon dioxide just from having this gas. It's basically just putting the oxygenator inside and allowing the carbon dioxide to come out. You can also do this thing. It's called a Prisma lung. Neither of these are available inside the United States. But this is our standard CRRT machine. This is the Prisma Flex, which is the same thing we have upstairs in our ICU. And they just have this added little thing on the side, which is the Prisma lung, which hooks onto it. And it's just a mini carbon dioxide removal filter and an oxygenator. And it takes the same flows that you use for hemodialysis. And you can drop someone's carbon dioxide level by about 40 to 50 points which means that you could take a patient with a COPD exacerbation, put in a dialysis line, and then hook them up to this machine and try to avoid intubation and mechanical ventilation, which means that you could get them up and walk them. And one of the biggest problems for patients with COPD is that when they lay in bed on the ventilator, they become deconditioned, and it's harder to get them moving forward. So if you could just put in a dialysis line and have them stand up and do exercises, you could actually potentially change the outcomes. Now, the, the downside is that the studies that have looked at this haven't shown any difference in mortality yet, but it's really interesting that you could try and do a novel technique. We can also do the same thing with our um, ECMO set. We, with our ECMO machine, we have the option of putting on different styles of oxygenators. We can either do an HLS-7 set, which allows us to do up to seven liters of flow, or we can do the 5.0 set, which allows us to go up to a maximum of five. It has less surface area, less flow rate, and allows us less risk of complication. Um, the other interesting thing you can do with ECMO is actually do eCPR. So this is ECMO CPR, 
Um, this is maybe the wave of the future. These are the number of cases of individuals in the ELSO registry that have received ECMO CPR moving forward. The idea behind this is you have an individual that you think should survive from um, CPR, but they are not surviving from it for some reason. They're in refractory VF. They still have ongoing need for chest compressions because of lack of pulse. And you know that if you could just get them into the cath lab and open up their LAD or open up their left main or open up something, that they would survive. So 40 to 50-year-old individuals that collapse right in front of you, you start CPR, they've got a low downtime. And if you could just do it, you could save their life. And this is what they're doing in Minnesota. So this is Dimitri Yiannopoulos and his team. They have a patient you can see in the back. So this is in the cath lab. There's this green thing here. This is the Lucas device. This is a mechanical CPR device that they've strapped onto this patient. This is a 50-year-old uh, man who had witness collapse in front of his family with immediate CPR. They were on scene within five minutes of doing this. They had the, ec they had the Lucas device in place with ongoing CPR. The patient was in refractory VF. They continued to shock. They continued to shock. They were down for over 10 minutes by the time they arrived. They had an in tidal CO2 of over 20, which suggests there was actually good flow. They had a palpable pulse. And then they put the patient on ECMO. They put the patient on ECMO. And all of a sudden, once you're on ECMO, you don't have to worry anymore because you've maintained cardiac output for the patient. If you get the flows going enough, it doesn't matter if the heart's pumping or not because you're just doing retrograde flow with oxygenated blood and providing circulation to the brain. Um, and then they have the, the same interventional uh, cardiologist then goes through the other groin past the catheter that's there, goes up, stents the LAD, whatever lesion they see, and then they keep them on ECMO and bring them back. They are now doing out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, transfer to their center, and putting them immediately onto ECMO. They have an age criteria of 18 to 75 with ongoing CPR, refractory, VFVT, um, that meets the inclusion criteria, and they go through all of this stuff. Um, they, can you get in an angiogram? Can they get in the cannula? If they can, if their ET, their entitled CO2 is over 10, their PAO2 is over 50, and a SAT of over 85% with a lactate of less than 18, they will place them on VA ECMO with a 25 French venous and a 17 to 19 French arterial cannulas. And then they go from there to cath lab to see if they can figure it out. And if they do, they continue it for an additional. If not, they try for 60 minutes to see if they can um, figure out the cause. If not, then they stop. But if they find it, then they just continue ECMO ACLS for 90 minutes um, if there's um, no return of cardiac function. Um, and then they'll move them to the ICU to see what happens. And this is their mortality rate. I mean, looking at the one month outcome for these individuals that otherwise would be declared dead. So 20 minutes of CPR, refractory VF, the majority of data from the Get With Guidelines suggests that most individuals cease CPR efforts at 20 minutes. So it's not a randomized trial, but if you're considering that historically 100% of these patients would be dead, they're seeing survival at one month of 10% and with a CPC or, um, performance status of one to two, which is depend, uh, independent of nine out of 18, which is pretty, pretty impressive that they're taking individuals that were dead and that they're doing this. ECMO's gotten a lot of press now. There's even an entire podcast. If you're interested in this, you can listen to these guys, ED ECMO. There's this uh, doc, um, Zach Shiner, who's actually the son-in-law of one of the physicians here. Um, and they talk about how they're taking patients with refractory cardiac arrest and putting them on ECMO in the cath lab or in the emergency room. And then the cardiologist shows up and they take them into the cath lab to do things. So you can also do this for sepsis. This is a data on long-term survival for individuals that are placed on VA ECMO for individuals with septic shock. The numbers really kind of stink. It's not that great. But, uh, you know, individuals that have refractory shock, we know that the mortality rate in um, sepsis is about 80% in that situation. And they're seeing survival rates of about 40%, which may be good. Still a really labor intense. So I'm going to skip this slide. I'm just going to show you this one other really interesting um, slide. So this is a young woman cystic fibrosis, um, who you can see that she's got a tracheostomy tube in place. Her lungs are completely full of nasty, nasty material. She meets criteria for ARDS. Um, and she had multidrug-resistant acinetobacter that they couldn't get rid of. She was awake. She was alert. She was talking. She was interactive on the ventilator. And everybody was really engaged with her. And they w really wanted to figure out a way to get her a transplant. And acinetobacter, any evidence of acinetobacter, this form of it, is a contraindication of getting a transplant. She said, there's no way we can get rid of the acinetobacter as long as her lungs are in place. They said, I have a great idea. Let's take out her lungs. So they put her on central ECMO. They actually opened up her chest, did a bilateral pneumonectomy. And then you can see that these cannulas are inside. They're actually pulling blood out and putting it right back into her heart. They just put her on total artificial support. They then did cultures and proved for 60 days that she had no bacteria inside of her body. She was completely bacterial free. They had her off all antibiotics. She was up and walking around on this. And then she got bilateral lung transplants and left the hospital alive. 
Now that's very resource intensive and not something we're going to do, but it is an idea of what you can do. So what are we doing at PPMC? I've told you we've been doing this for over a year. This is just the first eight patients we've done. Um, we had the first patient was a patient who presented here to the ED with severe necrotizing MRSA pneumonia. It was on ECMO for 26 days and was discharged to acute inpatient rehab. Patient number two was life flighted in from Medford um, with H1N1 with superimposed MRSA. Um, he was discharged to acute inpatient rehab. Um, he actually just went back in for routine hernia surgery um, and is back to work. Patient three died. Patient four was transferred from St. Vincent's after having an MI in the setting of severe coronavirus and strep pyogenes. He left. He actually came to see me in clinic. He's back out um, golfing 18 holes um, and teaching his grandchildren how to play golf. Um, patient number five died after um, severe disseminated MRSA. Um, we had a patient from St. Vincent's with Legionella pneumonia, another patient with a post-STEMI pulmonary hemorrhage, and then our last, our eighth patient was Status Asthmaticus, who um, ended up aspirating with bad PaCO2. His CO2 level was 130, um, and his then he aspirated in the middle of that and had severe hypoxemia, and he was able to be discharged home. This is the chest x-ray from number patient number two. You can see how bad his infiltrates were. This is a follow-up chest radiograph just before he left the hospital two months later. Um, and this is patient number six who presented to the ER, awake and alert, short of breath, coded an hour after admission, had progressive infiltrates that went from a clear chest x-ray to bilateral opacities, was on ECMO within 16 hours of presentation, and her chest x-ray four days later after she came off ECMO, she's also back and doing well. I'm going to skip this um, and this, and I just want to take time to make sure I can answer any questions. I want to thank all the CCS nursing staff. The nurses are absolutely incredible. The entire success of the program that we've built is based upon the nurses. We've set up a different model. The majority of models in the United States have a perfusionist nurse and other individuals. We have two nurses at the bedside who run the entire ECMO circuit. We don't have perfusionists here. It allows us to decrease our costs and maintain the same level of care that we want to do. Melissa Kohler would take a lead in terms of doing all the training. Um, she's an absolute rock star. PPMC administration who um, helped support and fund this. Jim Tuchmit who kind of helped um, push and develop the entire program and helped get the funding for us. Um, Louie Weber, who's our financial analyst. And then my partners, who are the best, um, who also take call and take care of all the patients and set up the foundation here that allowed us to build this program. So um, I also want to, since I think Jason Wills came back, Jason's the medical director of ECMO. I'm just his assistant, and he deserves a lot of credit for putting everything together as well. So with that, I'll take any questions you have. Yeah, so the question is, is there a, is there a difference in post-survival life expectancy for individuals that receive ECMO for those that don't? And in the data that we have so far, it does not appear that there's a difference in terms of long-term survival. Those individuals that make it out of the hospital are just as likely to last as long as individuals that did not require ECMO. Margaret Herridge published data in 2000, um, sorry, in 2011 that shows the five-year survival for individuals with ARDS and included a sub-cohort of individuals with ECMO suggests that their lung function actually is still reduced at five years at about 76%, but in the entire cohort. Jesse? Yeah, so the question is, it, it, biologically plausible, why does it make sense? And the patients that we put on ACMO, when you put them on, you're, the, it seems like it's really cool, but for those of us that are doing this, the first 24 to 48 hours when you put a patient on ECMO are nerve-wracking. You've taken someone's blood, you've exposed it to a biomembrane that if they weren't in shock before, they are in severe shock. These patients are ramped up. They're exposed to a protein. We see these individuals that they just look sick as crap. Um, you have onset of DIC. Um, the other problem is that the disease process that got them to where they're at is sometimes difficult to control. One of the hard parts, too, is if these individuals have pneumonia, your normal process of clearing pneumonia is to get rid of the bacteria inside of your lungs. And we do that frequently by coughing and to try and clear out secretions. We're trying to put them on ultra lung protective ventilation. So we put these patients, sometimes we're getting tidal volumes of about 35 to 40 milliliters. That's not even enough to ventilate their dead space. Um, and we're trying to get that stuff out and we have to wait for the body to really try and get rid of it. Long-term complication rates are high. The risk of superior recurrent infection, bleeding rates are very high. 
And then honestly, some of the patients we put on have just been so sick to begin with. The, late, the third patient that we put on, she'd arrested twice before we put her on. Um, one of our most recent patients that actually arrested four times before we put her on, and she had severe anoxia, and she, we just couldn't support her. Her brain was already dead. And that's the problem, is that individuals get so sick, and the question still remains, how soon do you put these patients on? And I think there's this, this kind of gravity, this uh, reluctance to try and send patients to a center. We're all taught in pulmonary critical care fellowship how to take care of ARDS, and it's difficult to send them somewhere else, right? We're, we're, no one wants to relinquish the care of the patient they have until they're over their heads. And the problem is that people aren't recognizing when they're over their heads or they're waiting to the last minute, and that makes it a little bit harder. Um, um, but yeah, the patients are just really, really, really sick. Sorry, you had a question? So, what, so the question is, what are our maximum values in PEEP in a high level um, while patients are on ECMO? We follow the EOLIA protocol. So um, the, when we started the program in order to get certified, we sent four physicians out to Paris. So we all went to La Pitié and spent a week in their um, ICU rounding with them. We put everybody on bi-level ventilation. So we don't use standard volume control ventilation. We put them on APRV. So we set our top P high or a PEEP high of 24 and a P low of 12. And we just, in a set at a rate of 10, okay? So these patients really are not being ventilated at all. So you usually see a respiratory rate of 10 and a tidal volume of between 30 and 70 milliliters. Okay, that it, yeah. And then before they go on, we still are, before we go on, if we will try to do a, P, a, a plateau of 30, but if they're failing that while we're trying to get them on the ECMO, we'll go up to 35, 36. That lady that I showed, case number six, the lady who was arrested on uh, the 4th of July, in order to get a SAT of 62%, I had her on eight cc's per kilogram, 100% FiO2, a PEEP of 18 nitric oxide neuromuscular blockade, and I had her prone. And the moment I unproned her, her SATs dropped to 50% with a PaO2 of, I think the lowest one we got was 28, um, and she was blue, it, as blue as Jesse's shirt when we got her into the cath lab. And then once on ECMO, all of a sudden she was pink. So we use standard ventilation, lung protective ventilation before ECMO. And after that, we do really, really, really low pressure. It's less than two cc's per kilogram based upon, I mean, it's basically undetectable true ventilation. Amy? Yeah, so Amy's question is, how does ethics play a role? One of the inclusion criteria that we have at PPMC is we will not place a patient on ECMO if there is not a designated and defined surrogate decision maker. We've run into problems because patients come from outside facilities where we're told that they have a husband or a spouse or someone else that will be involved, and they've shown up and they're not married, and their spouse has the last case we talked about at Schwartz Rounds last week was an individual that had a significant traumatic brain injury and had fixed delusions and was unable to make decisions, and that creates a big problem. The ethics is actually an integral part of the training that we went through, and we've involved ethics up front. But we ask every family to meet with palliative care up front. The reported outcomes on ECMO are still only a survival of about 50, 52 to 58 percent, depending upon the year that you're looking at. So it's still a one in two chance that these patients are going to die. Families need to be aware for that up front, but you also have to be aware that these are long runs, right? We talked about 35 days, we talked about 26 days, and the longest run was seven, or sorry, over 600 days at an outside center. That individual is waiting for lung transplant. It's hard if someone's awake and they're interactive, like the ethics case of you, I mean, the, the VAA ECMO and cardiac support gets much worse, um, uh, much more tricky and involved. But ethics has to be involved, and we've worked with Nick and the rest of the ethics group and talked to palliative care ahead of time. And we engage people and start talking about the point that individuals aren't going to survive and that we need to stop. Yes, sir? Is there a difference now come between men and women? Uh, is, the question was, is there a difference now come between men and women? And not that I'm aware of. So, yeah, the John's question is about cost. It's really expensive. Um, the largest single bill that we've submitted was um, one patient racked up 
uh, $1.4 million during his hospital stay here. Um, he had insurance coverage and that was covered. Um, that's a lot of money. Um, I look at it, he was uh, my age, he's a grandfather. His daughter had just given birth to a six month or six month prior. So he was, he's back at work. He's a functioning member of society. Um, he's continuing to help and support. Um, we have never made a decision not to put someone on ECMO because of insurance cost. With that said, CMS changed their reimbursement rules October 1st, 2018, with no input from any medical society, and just said that ECMO um, is not, uh, it's not complex anymore, it's very easy to do, and you should be paid for um, the same maintenance as a patient on standard ventilation for over five days. So that's currently being, yeah, so you get paid the same as mechanical ventilation with a tracheostomy for 96 hours as you do for ECMO if the patient has Medicare or Medicaid, um, which basically means the hospital will lose money. Um, like a lot of things, there are areas where you can add and you can't, and it really now that gets into the questions of ethics of if it's really gonna cost this much and it's gonna put the program out of business, do you just not offer it to individuals that don't have insurance coverage? You do that for individuals that want a kidney transplant, a heart transplant, a lung transplant, it's difficult to do when you have a recoverable thing that you could try and treat someone through. Um, but that's, we're supposed to have a update on the reevaluation of Medicare final rule in February because of some appeals that had happened. Um, but it is incredibly expensive. The program itself is supporting itself and has generated a profit. Um, the, one of the reasons that we kind of are doing this is because PA Providence Health Plan was actually spending a lot of money to put patients on ECMO at other centers and they said we don't want to spend all of that money can we keep our patients inside um, we have physicians that have experience doing this could we try and build this program and make it work so it's again you know the costs in the united states are much higher than national health service in um, great britain um, the data out of great britain looks like it's actually a better cost the more recent data suggests they're actually able to streamline decrease costs long term um, and we're seeing that potentially with our patients as well but i don't have great data from here Thank you.